And I think when we talk about being genuine, it's about saying, I, am, I know who I am. I know who I'm not. I know how I function. I know how I don't function. And I want to be the same person day in and day out. Right? And so if you want to help, you know, kind of study, what does God's word say about being genuine? How can I be more genuine? How can I genuinely be who God wants me to be? If any of those boxes you want to check, this is the series for you to come. This is the time you want to be at Thrive Church because we're going to be opening up God's word and saying, man, what, look at what happens. Look at what happens when we let God use us the way he designed us. When we let God use us the way he wants to use us, and, and, and when I am genuine to God, I make a huge impact in the world that I live in. I want to talk about an individual who made a huge impact. He doesn't look very friendly. Let's just say that. You see the screen behind me? And you try to figure out who he is. Let me read you his life story as you look at his picture. When he died on December 22nd, 1899, the thousands who gathered for his funeral were told Though he made no inventions and he had no discoveries, though he wrote no poems, painted no pictures, and led no triumphant armies, this unlettered son of a poor woman in New England made an impression on the world that this dying century has seldom seen. Do I have your interest? This guy made a big impact even though he didn't do the things most famous people did. He was born February 5th, 1837, on a remote farm in rural Massachusetts, on a poverty-stricken home. His mother was a devoted believer. His father was an alcoholic. But he became famous for conquering whole cities for Christ. He was in love with money, but ended up changing his priorities to live in austere conditions so that more money could go to the spread of the gospel. He dropped down to school at 13, and he later was led to faith by a Sunday school teacher at age 17. He once preferred to teach children only because he was uncomfortable with adults due to his lack of education, but ended up being one of the most persuasive orators of his day. He inspired students at Cambridge University in England, and he founded an internationally known school and church. He was indeed one of the most unlikely candidates that God could use so mightily. He was an impulsive man, as one writer put it. He had the rough humanity of the Apostle Peter, the strategic skill and hardiness of the Apostle Paul, and the love and steady growth of the Apostle John. He came to Chicago. That's a clue, in case you're trying to figure out who it is. He came to Chicago with the intention of becoming a wealthy businessman, but also began a Sunday school in the poorest, most crime-ridden area of the city. It, in that needy environment, he discovered that leading children to faith in Christ was more rewarding than making money. Anybody know who it is? Any guesses? D.L. Moody. We got it correct. First service got it. Second service got it. That's, you know, I look at his picture, and like he is giving an emotion. Maybe he looks moody. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Charlie Humbert played that one. He was right. He looked a little moody to me. You know, here's a quote where we're going to land a play. I want you to see it behind me. While in England, he heard an evangelist, Henry Verile, say, the world has yet to see what God can do through a man who is totally yielded to him. D.L. Moody was captivated by these words and resolved, by the grace of God, I will be that man. Look at that quote again in the bold right up there. The world has yet to see what God can do through a man who is totally yielded to him. I think that tracks with being genuine. I think the world has yet to see what does it look like for you and for I to be a genuine believer, to be true to God, no matter who is watching, who is listening, who is looking, who is pressuring you to cheat, to lie, to shortcut, no matter what situation you are in, you're 100% genuine to who God has called you to be, and you're 100% genuine to following God where he has called you to go. That quote is one that I heard as a young man that was thought-provoking and challenging. What is it that God could do in my life if I fully trusted him? What is it God can do through you in your life if you fully trust and follow him as well. I think D.L. Moody was a genuine Christ follower. It was unlikely. He was uneducated. He had not the right background nor the pedigree or the diploma or the, the family lineage. Like He was a poor child from Massachusetts that quit school at 13, got saved, and then in turn 
revolutionized a lot of America. Many, many, many people came to Christ, and there's still a church 150 years later in Chicago functioning in a Bible institute training more people for ministry because what that man did. If you're truly genuine and follow where God calls you to go, just think about how incredible your impact could be, the way God wants to use you to grow his kingdom. It's that thought of how much can happen that we at Thrive Church say, you know what, we believe at Thrive Church, if we're genuine in our faith, and we're sincere in who God's called us to be, and we're willing to let God lead us to step out of our comfort zone, man, he's going to use us to make a big impact. That's why being genuine matters, because it means you're being obedient and faithful to the calling of God. Talking about taking a step, last week we talked about you with you guys. Um, how many of you guys were here last week? Remember these cards? Remember what I'm talking about? You guys are here? So if you, you don't know what I'm talking about, this is your chance. We're going to bring you up to speed. These cards are in the chair backs in front of you. You can see they fold in half. They're perforated like that. There's three circles on them. So if you didn't get one of these last week, this is your chance to participate this week. Last week, we talked about, listen, as, as Christ followers with the Holy Spirit in us, right? God wants us to reach people who don't go to church yet. God wants us to have a simple impact, right? We're simple. I'm simple. You're like, let, let's face it, right? We just, we just want to have a simple impact in people's lives. And a way that we do that is we want to identify three people that we know that are unchurched. They don't go to church. They don't know what they don't know. They haven't heard about Jesus much. They're just, they're just in their walk going through life. And God has put them in your life and you're connected to them, whether you work with them, you're friends with them, you play sports with them. But there's people in your world that you're like, hey, I know three people that I can pray for, saying, God, would you give me an open door? Would you give me an open door, an opportunity? Would you give me a chance to be able to talk to them about you? So number one, there's three people you're going to pray for each day. God, will you give me a chance to talk to Bob or to Sam or to Pete, right? Now, in my life, I put three names on. Two of those names, I drive past their house every day when I come to work. Drive past their house every day. And, and I've been investing in friendship for 10 years with them, just doing events and things. But now, because I put their name on this card, as I drive past their house, I'm praying in a more focused way. I, that's what's changed in my life. That's one of the things. Maybe in your life, you've seen change by filling this card out. You've been more intentional, more aware. I'm praying for the man. I'm praying for his wife and for his kids and for the home. And it's like, I'm just saying, God, will you give me an open door? Colossians chapter 4, verse 3. The next piece on this card is saying, I'm going to pray for these three names. The next piece is saying, I'm going to intentionally care. I'm going to invest in the relationship. And so, again, in Luke 6, 31, do unto others as you would have them do to you. It's just saying, I, I want to care for them the way Jesus would care for them. And so these cards have been turned in. We got 60 cards last week, 60 times three. That's a big number. What are we talking about? Thank you, right? 180, that's how many names we're, we're saying we are faithfully praying for and asking God to do. Part of the question is like, why does Thrive need two campuses? Because if we do our job as Christ followers, guess what's going to happen here? You're not going to fit anymore, right? You're not going to fit anymore. We need to reach more people. We need to go. We need to see that. And so we want to get as many names on that banner in that lobby as we can because that's what our church is doing. We are focusing. We're praying. We're saying, God, will you use me just like D.L. Moody? I want God to use me fully devoted, see where God will do with me in that. As a church, we're saying, will you use our church? Will you use each individual person at Thrive to make this commitment to say, here's the names here's what I'm doing. Here's what I understand. I want to have a simple impact for God's kingdom in this way. These cards are in front of you. If you didn't turn one in, we really want to get those back. We really want to know that as Thrive Church, we got people saying, I've picked people, I'm praying for people, and I'm pushing forward. Now, now last week, I know some people, we spent the whole Sunday talking about how to have a simple impact. And then some people said afterwards, and it, it's honest, thank you for being genuine and honest. Some people said, I don't have any friends who don't go to church. There's nobody in my world. All my family goes to church. All my friends are at church. Church, 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 right? I understand that, right? I understand. And so I hear that, and I'm thinking in my head, are they asking me to say, I absolve you, my child, from what Jesus asked you to do, right? Am I hearing them say, can you just excuse, will you sign the paper that I don't have any unchurched friends and just say it's okay for me not to try to find people to pray for or love or care for? And it's like, I get that, right? I get that. But I just want to give this answer. It's like, guys, if, if we're not doing this, what are we doing? Right? If, if, 
if, if we're feeling convicted and challenged because we're not doing this, that might be the Holy Spirit convicting and challenging us because God's word has said it. Jesus has modeled it. And he's saying, let's go. And we're like, well, I don't have anybody, so let somebody else go, right? Now, there are other cards. How many names do we ask for? Three. There are other cards. I don't know who you guys are to turn them in, but there's like name after name after name. They're just spilling out. And all of my friends, it was like, oh my goodness, this person knows tons of people. This is great. This is easier for some of you to do and harder for some of you to do as well. Like, let's recognize that. Some people are gifted and they're engaged and they, they know lots of people. And others of us, it's, it's, it's a little scary talking to somebody we don't know, right? But who's in you? Holy Spirit. What does he ask you to do? Show them the love of Christ. Will he give you the power? Will he give you the opportunity? Will he, like, it's on our end to say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to commit to do this. So that's why we're giving these cards, because it's an action step. You rip it in half, you take half with you, and then you, you give half to church, and then we will be praying for you. We'll put the names on the, on the board out there, and we'll be praying for you in that way. So we're serious about this, guys. We are excited, because I believe that's what it looks like to grow a church telling people about Jesus, being Jesus, letting the Holy Spirit make that gospel seed grow. And in turn, we're seeing growth happen because more people are coming into the kingdom of God because we're doing what God has asked us to do. That's what genuine people do. That's how genuine people live. So, so back to the topic of genuine. What, what makes a person genuine? What, what makes a person genuine? You know, really, I, I think there's characteristics. You know one when you see one, Right? Like, that's what I just got. Like, you know one when you see one. I know a genuine person. I, I sense it. I feel it. They're consistent. They're real. They're honest. They're caring. They're kind. They're trustworthy. They look me in the eye. They listen to me when I talk, right? That's what makes, like, you, I, I get good vibes from that person because I get it. They seem to know who they are. There's a confidence in their genuineness, right? And the other side is like, there's somebody who's like, I don't trust them. I don't get that vibe. They're sneaky. They're tricky. They're not honest. Their eyes never look me in the eye. They never listen. They never slow down, right? And you get that read on that person. You're like, I don't know if that's a genuine person, right? So, so there, there's things that we see that we get and that we understand. And so we've got to take a look at this. Jesus gave us a parable to help us understand what makes a genuine per person genuine, Right? He gave us a parable, a story that is an example that is very basic and easy to understand that answers the question, what makes a genuine person genuine? Do you want to see that story? Do you want to see the answer to how Jesus answered what makes a genuine person genuine? And you turn to Luke chapter 6. This is just a three verses. It's a short parable. But Luke chapter 6 is where Jesus describes what makes a genuine person genuine. Here it is on the screen behind me. Luke chapter 6, verse 43. It says, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. According to this, if I watch somebody, if I listen to somebody, if I observe someone, over a course of time, I'll see their actions, I'll see their behaviors, I'll see their reactions, I'll see their decisions, I'll see their financial choices, I'll see their, their you get to see a lot about that person, don't you? And over that period of time, the things that that person does and where they go and how they operate and who they talk to and all of that parts define what kind of tree that is. It shows what kind of tree it is. It reveals what that person is producing with their time, their talent, their treasure here on this earth. What are they contributing? What are they, what are they put? like, you see it. It's right there. It's a simple answer. You want to know if someone's genuine? See what kind of fruit they're producing. See what kind of fruit they're producing. Now, let's dig in a little bit deeper into this passage. I made some words bold. Do you see them up there? Number one, your behavior, your action, your fruit comes from what? Look, it says the good stored up in his heart. And it says the evil stored up in his heart. I like different Bible translations because there's Greek words that are being used that can be translated differently, right? And so sometimes you get a, a, a context, a nuance, so you get to see the different translations come out. Stored up, that word can be translated treasured stored up 
treasured. Your storehouse, your treasure house. What do you store up, the things you treasure? Why do you treasure it? Because you like it, you value it, you see the importance to it, you believe in it, you're committed to it. I treasure some things in my life that are important to me, right? I treasure some things that make my life better, that I benefit from, I identify myself to. You look around, like listen to somebody talk, you'll hear what they talk about because they're passionate about it, they treasure it. A good person stores up good in their heart because in their heart they treasure good. In their heart they know what good is, right? They, they know what good looks like, they know what good does. They, they're genuinely, they value good. And their fruit reveals their heart is good because they're treasuring that up. Now, think about this on the evil side. An evil person stores up evil in his heart, and the evil in his heart comes out in his actions. Why would someone treasure evil? Why would someone value evil? Why would somebody collect and accumulate evil and put it on a shelf in their, in their life on display? Be like, here, come into my house. Let me show you all the things I love, the things I collect, the decorations that I have. Right? Why, why would they hold on to that and make it that obvious? Because their, their hearts are wired to seek it out. Their hearts are wired to find it. It's what gets them excited. It's what makes their heart beat pulse. It's what gets them fired up in life. Man, I love, it's like, wait a minute, you love evil? Yeah, I love evil. Like, we sometimes have a hard time saying that, but let's be honest, all of us were born with a sin nature. All of us were born with a sin nature, and in my flesh, listen, talk about Father's Day. I told my kids, you're allowed to say whatever you want to say to me, but you have to say it respectfully. <laughs> Because in my flesh and my sin nature, if my kids come at me disrespectfully, I'm not a very good dad because I match their disrespect. <laughs> and sometimes I go over their disrespect and sometimes I crush them. I'm like, ooh, I should have done that. But my sin nature makes me greedy at times. My sin nature makes me selfish sometimes. My, my sin nature makes me respond in anger sometimes. My, my sin nature, like it's there. It is there. But thankfully, when I accepted Christ, I put my faith in Jesus, I understand the Bible, the Word of God, what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit comes into me, and the Holy Spirit transforms me and changes me and helps me to be more genuine and helps me to value and treasure good. Because without Christ, I don't think you would want to know me. Without Jesus changing who I am, I would be greedy. I'd be looking to manipulate you, to use you, to take what I can, make advantage, and like move on, Right? I know my flesh. I know my sin nature. I know what makes me tick. Thank God I have the ability to have the Holy Spirit in me and direct me and change me because that's what impacts the fruit that comes out of my life. So when you see fruit in me and I see fruit in you that reflects God the Father, that's evidence of the Holy Spirit's in you and that that Holy Spirit's working in you and changing you and redirecting you, right? People without the Holy Spirit produce bad fruit, Period. That's the parable. That's the point. You're not going to find good fruit on a bad tree. You're not going to find good fruit or bad fruit on a good tree. So, so it's your life pro product that's coming out of you that's a reflection of who is in you. Your actions are tied to the things that you treasure. And that's hard to hear sometimes, but the brokenness in you is there because you're treasuring brokenness. You're allowing evil to store up and accumulate. And God wants to change you, and he wants to make you more genuine to who he's calling you to be. Listen, I would answer what makes a person genuine is revealing what is on the inside through your actions on the outside. Right? Revealing on the inside by your actions on the outside. Not just talking the talk. We all come to church, we can act like we're perfect, and we never sin, and we never struggle, and we're never, you know, in a conflict with our kids. Like, we, we can come to church and tidy up, and put the makeup on, and put on the good clothes, and right, and then we go back to our cars, we shut the door, and we scream at our kids, and we lose our minds. Maybe that doesn't happen to you. Maybe it's just, you know, but reality is like, listen, I got to be real about what's on the inside, because it's coming out on the outside, and if God changes what's on the inside, it will change the outside. I become more genuine as I let God produce and bear fruit in my life. So how's this going to happen? How's this going to happen? The world is yet to see what God can do through a man who is totally yielded to him. 
When I become genuine and I yield to God, I'll be able to see him use me in big ways. Problem is, the church has taught this incorrectly over the years. And when I say years, I mean thousands of years. I mean Paul addresses it in the book of Galatians. The church can misteach how to be a good person. The church can tell you this is how you do it, and they're wrong. And that's why Paul addresses it in Galatians. Look at what he says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 3. It's on the screen behind me. He says, are you so foolish? Sometimes I am. Thanks for asking. Are you so foolish after beginning by the means of the Spirit, you got saved, you understand the gospel and who Jesus is, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? I'll bench press it, baby. Just give me the work. I can lift it. I can do it. I got this, right? Or or are you going to let God continue to change you? Are you going to try to change your heart and your attitude and your greed and your lust and your addiction to sin? Are you going to try to do that all through your own? I'll just be a better person. Willpower, baby. More willpower and I'll win. Are you so foolish? You started this thing in the spirit and now you're going to finish it in the flesh? I'm in control. It's me. I can do it. I don't need God. I don't need other Christians. I don't need the Bible. I don't need, I don't need community with other believers. I, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Paul's like, you're not. <laughs> What's the sign say? Frustration ahead. <laughs> Guys, we're not being genuine if we're doing it in our own flesh. Frustration ahead, right? Galatians 5.16 says this. So I say, what's the big words? Walk by the Spirit. This flesh and strength, it's not about you trying harder. It's you saying, I will walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. If you want to be genuine, let God lead you and follow him. Let him produce fruit through you. Allow him to change you. Engage the word of God in prayer, reading it, having it read you and be honest about it. If you want to see that change happen, that is how you do it. A genuine Christ follower will say, it isn't me. It is the what? There you go. It's the spirit in me. That's what genuine people say. It's not, I did this and I'll do that. And I'm gonna, it's like, God's changing me. When I listen to people talk, I like to hear testimony words like, well, God convicted, God challenged, God changed, God gave me life. The Bible, the word of God, community, accountability, other believers, all of those words to me are genuine, real change. When it's performance-based and it's all about what others think of me and it's not internal, to me, I'm like, man, that's, that's you trying to change you. That's you trying to change you, and are you so foolish? And frustration lies ahead, and you're not going to be able to do it. But when you walk in the Spirit, you're going to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the beautiful things that come out of a genuine relationship with Christ, where the Holy Spirit is working in you. See, here's the struggle. Sometimes you think, right, I'm living a logical life right now. I'm living a logical life, but it doesn't match what the Word of God says. See, here's the logic the world says. The world says love, what? If it is, all right, the world says love must be earned if it is to be returned. How well does your marriage work with that logic? Honey, if you don't serve me the way I want to be served, You're not getting served the way you want to be served, right? How does that work with your kids? Kids, you come at me and you're disrespectful. I'm not, right? Coworkers, right? It makes sense. You're a jerk to me. I'm going to be a jerk back to you. You bite my head off. I'm going to bite your head off. You want to push? I'm going to push, right? Is that not how the world lives? I'm not foolish. I'm not naive, right? That's what normal is. And so you leave Thrive Church, the building with all the believers, and you're worshiping and singing and clapping, and you're like, man, God's doing such great stuff. And you step back into the world, it's like getting hit by a bus. You get buzzsawed. People come in, they crush you, they scream at you, they lose their minds on you. You're like, wait, this whole love thing and this genuine thing, that's out the window. (laughs) Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, right? That's Old Testament. The idea of loving others the way they love you is the world's logic. And when you use the logic in the Christian faith, it's not going to get you where Jesus wants you to go. So when we talk about fruit of the Spirit and love and walking in the Spirit, here's what Jesus says about love in John 13, 34. A new command I what? I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. 
What did genuine Christ followers do? They love people with God's love. They love the unlovely. They love the unlovable. They meet somebody with God's love coming through them. A good tree produces good fruit. A good fruit in your life is loving people with God's love. Patient, forgiving 70 times 7, encouraging, correcting in, in the way that you're like, I'll walk beside you. I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. I'm not like showing real love with a spine and representing it and walking beside that person because God's love's in me and I can love you the way God loves you. That's the fruit that happens when we let the Holy Spirit lead and we let the Holy Spirit push. Now, and this whole series, I want to circle back to this each week because it's true. This series is not a come on, you can do better. This series is about seeing the one that did and does better. I want you to see Jesus clearer. I want you to hear the Holy Spirit louder. I want you to understand the word of God better because in all of those things, it's saying, you know what? The more your eyes are on Jesus, the more you're reading this book, the more time you're spending in prayer and solitude and reflection, the more Jesus is transforming you the more fruit you're going to produce, it's not about you trying harder or keeping a list of things you're not going to do, right? I remember talking to a student in student ministry, had a rubber band around his wrist. It's like, every time I say a swear word, I snap myself. It's my swear, but anybody ever hear that? Like that idea, every time I do something I'm not supposed to do, I snap the rubber band? No? Nobody? Yes? Okay, thank you, right? I got news for you. That's not going to change your language. That's going to make your wrist sore, <laughs> right? That's going to leave a mark because the issue of brokenness is in your heart. It's not about, come on, you can do better. It's this, come on and see Jesus clearer. Understand his love for you better. Understand what it means to be a genuine Christ follower and what he's asking you to do. So this week, I want you to live first and preach second. Can you do that? I want you to live first and preach second. Far too many churches tell Christ followers to preach first <laughs> and not live at all. No, to, to, to say the words, but not walk the walk. So if we're going to produce fruit and we're going to love and we're going to move forward in this way, this week, this is what I want you to say, I will walk in the Spirit and allow God to use me to show others His love in a tangible way. Can I just say this? That does not say, God, I'm just going to pray 15 minutes more each day. That doesn't check that box, does it? It does not say, God, I'm going to read an extra book in the Old Testament this week. To show. That doesn't check the box. It doesn't say, I'm going to memorize five more Bible verses, right? So many times we think, well, God just wants me to pray, read the Bible, and go to church. He does. But what else does he want you to do? Love people in a tangible way. Bear fruit. Show it. And if you're here, like, I, I don't want to commit to love someone in a tangible way. Uh, okay. You're not doing what Jesus asked you to do. You're not following where Jesus wants you to go. If Thrive Church is going to bring glory to God, Thrive Church is going to love people in tangible ways. They're going to show it. They're going to invest. They're going to care. They're going to get involved. They're going to get their hands dirty. And they're going to find ways to know people that don't know Jesus and show them love. Like, we're not going to quit. We're not going to give up. We're going to push forward in this. Why? Because I have a genuine faith, and that genuine faith changes who I am. Will you pray with me? Lord, this morning, we just thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for how you're using us to bring glory to you. And God, we want to get even more focused. We want to get more serious. We want to get better at what we're doing, God, to give you the glory. So Father, this morning, as the Holy Spirit might be challenging, convicting, the word of God, as we read it, you define genuineness as a good tree bearing good fruit. God, I, I want to pray for people in this room that, that are in a battle right now because they're aware that they might be treasuring and storing up evil. They're treasuring and storing up things that are just ungodly, that you don't want them to be evolved in or to be evolved with. God, I pray you would convict and challenge and reveal the things that they need to change to be more genuine, to store up the good, to allow you to change their hearts and to bear the fruit that makes it obvious to the people watching them that they love God and they love people. Father, give us courage to love in tangible ways, to love in real ways, to trust and follow and, and to be willing to allow our faith to impact people around us because we love them so much. God, I praise the church that we will get to see how you can use us because we fully surrender and yield to you in a genuine and an authentic way. God, thanks for knowing what we need and when we need it. 
pointing out the brokenness and coaching us for how to move forward. Father, I pray that it's not just come on, do better, but it's get our eyes on you more and surrender our lives to you more. God, we want to do great things for you and we want to follow trust that you are going to use us in a powerful way to increase and expand your kingdom. We praise you in the name of Jesus.